Greetings and a very warm welcome to everyone to this very special webinar, Curbing the Invisible Pandemic, Effective Solutions to Collectively Combat Antimicrobial Resistance. I am Satyajit Sarkar, a research scientist and the technical lead for AMR policy and advocacy here at IVI. I will be your host today. This event is organized by the International Vaccine Institute, uh, the Asian Development Bank, Institute Pasteur, uh, Korea, um, and the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, and the Embassy of Denmark in the Republic of Korea. As of about an hour ago, more than 500 people had registered for this webinar, and from 55 countries or more, and we hope a majority of them would join in today, finally. While we're still in the grip of the highly visible and headline-grabbing COVID-19 pandemic, Antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, which is often described as a faceless pandemic, continues to be responsible for approximately 700,000 deaths annually and a staggering economic burden on many countries. AMR has also been described as a wicked problem driven by multiple and interrelated factors at the intersection of human, animal, and environmental health. Therefore, the response to AMR demands a One Health approach. Today, we will be focusing on tools such as the development of vaccines, new drugs, as well as a range of policy actions to tackle AMR, and discuss eff effective strategies for strengthening capacities and capabilities in low and middle income countries, and the generation of actionable data to support context specific and evidence based solutions. Uh, today's program is broadly in three parts. In the first part, we will have brief remarks from five distinguished scientists and leaders. The second part, which will be moderated by myself, uh, will comprise three technical presentations of about 10 minutes each on the potential of some specific tools and strategies to stop the emergence and spread of AMR. The presentations will be followed by a 10-minute Q&A session open to all. The third and final part will be a panel discussion uh, moderated by Dr. Eduardo Banzon of the Asian Development Bank. And four highly accomplished panelists will respond to the technical presentations and at the same time offer their own critical insights on the strategies needed to strengthen global, regional, and local capacities and capabilities to contain AMR. The panel discussion will be followed by a 20 minute Q&A. The webinar will conclude with key takeaways from the three sessions summarized by Dr. Eduardo Banzon and myself. Now a reminder of a few housekeeping rules, important. This webinar is being recorded and it will be made available in due course and all participants will be informed about it. Second, please put all your questions for the speakers or panelists in the Q&A box only because that is what we are monitoring for questions. The moderators at their discretion will select and pose the questions to the relevant speaker. We're keeping the chat box open, but please use it only for comments you wish to make or to provide additional insights or information on the topic at hand. Questions must be placed in the Q&A box and not in the chat. And now we present a pre-recording of congratulatory remarks by Dr. Una Her. She's a member of the Science ICT Broadcasting and Communications Committee uh, of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. Dr. Her. 안녕하십니까. 21대 국회의원 허은아입니다. 먼저 국회 과학기술정보방송통신위원회를 대표하여 항생제 내성 국제 공조 웨비나 개최를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 뜻깊은 행사를 공동 개최하는 주한 덴마크 대사관 국제 백신 연구소 아시아 개발 은행 한국 파스테르 연구소 국제 항생제 내성 솔루션 센터에 감사드립니다. 또한 주한 덴마크 아이너 엔센 대사님, 국제 백신 연구소 제롬 김 사무총장님, 아시아 개발 은행 동남아시아 국장님, 어, 한국 파스테르 연구소 지영미 소장님께도 깊은 감사를 드립니다. 많은 간염병 전문가들이 신종 간염병에 의한 팬데믹 예측을 하여 왔지만 우리가 지난 2년간 겪은 코로나19와 같은 팬데믹 상황은 아무도 예상하지 못했습니다. 전문가들은 포스트 코로나 후에도 미지의 질병 대유행을 예측하고 있습니다. 이러한 상황에서 
항생제 내성 문제도 지속적으로 소리 없이 인류의 건강을 위협하는 큰 위험 요인으로 특히 기존의 항생제들로는 치료가 불가능한 소위 슈퍼박테리아 감염은 인류 건강을 매우 심각하게 위협하고 있습니다. 조용한, 느린 또는 보이지 않는 대유행으로 널리 설명되는 항생제 내성은 적극적 조치를 취하지 않으면 매년 70만 명이 사망하고 2050년에는 1000만 명이 사망할 것으로 추산하는 가운데 세계보건기구도 매년 11월 셋째 주를 세계 항생제 내성 인식 주간으로 지정하였고요. 항생제 내성 극복을 위한 글로벌 감시 체계 구축 등 다양한 노력을 하고 있다고 알고 있습니다. 항생제 내성 문제를 해결하기 위해서는 사람뿐만 아니라 가축, 식품, 환경 분야를 포괄하는 공통의 노력, 원헬스 개념의 접근이 필요하며 전 세계 및 지역적으로 확산을 방지하기 위한 글로벌 협력이 절실히 요구됩니다. 인류를 위협하고 있는 항생제 내성 문제를 해결하기 위한 덴마크 정부의 리더십에 다시 한번 감사드리고 한국 정부도 이러한 노력에 적극 동참하고 함께 문제를 해결하기 위해 지원을 아끼지 않겠습니다. 오늘 이 자리가 항생제 내성 극복을 위해 국제공정 및 협력 방안을 함께 모색하는 중요한 첫걸음이 되기를 기대하면서 한국과 덴마크는 물론 전 세계 각국의 참여를 이끌어내는 소중한 기회가 되기를 기원합니다. 다시 한번 항생제 내성 국제공조 웨비나 개최를 축하드리고요. 행사를 주최하고 발표, 토론을 준비해 주신 연자와 패널 여러분, 또본 웨비나를 경청해 주시는 모두 차, 모든 참석자 분들께 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. We thank Dr. Her for her remarks and especially her call for international cooperation and solidarity to fight AMR. We next have remarks by His Excellency Einar Jensen. Ambassador of Denmark to the Republic of Korea. Ambassador Jensen is an agricultural scientist by training and for the last 20 years has served in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has previously served as the Danish ambassador to Bangladesh and to Tanzania. Over to His Excellency Einar Jensen. Good evening all. As an ambassador of Denmark to Korea, I'm honored to be there, invited to speak to you at the opening of this important event. Today's webinar is addressing a serious threat to public health and safety. Antimicrobial resistance has risen to become one of the biggest threats to our society. WHO has declared AMR as one of the top 10 global public health threats facing humanity. Especially low and middle income countries will be severely affected by AMR. These are places where there is less access to clean water sufficient sanitation and hygiene, as well as affordable medicines and vaccines. Over 750,000 people uh, die each year due to AMR-related infections. This is estimated to rise to 10 million deaths by 2050. These numbers underscore how serious we need to take this threat. Therefore, I'm pleased that today's webinar will address concerns and highlight solutions to the AMR threat. It is a complex matter and requires a united approach from multiple stakeholders and across borders. By working together, we will stand much stronger. I am pleased that two important organizations, the International Vaccine Institute and the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, ICAS, are addressing the AMR threat with special attention to low- and middle-income countries. The Danish initiative, ICARS, aimed to help reduce drug-resistance infections by collaborating with low- and middle-income countries. Along with the other important organizations and initiatives represented here today, these collective initiatives will raise awareness of evidence-based solutions targeted at the AMR threat. We will need to take social responsibility and help combat AMR everywhere on the globe. With many knowledgeable speakers presenting today, I am sure that we can learn a lot from each other and work together on a safer and more sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jensen. It is my pleasure next to invite Dr. Jerome Kim, the Director General of IVI, to share his thoughts. 
Dr. Kim is a medical doctor by training from Yale University and has extensive experience in molecular virology and pathogenesis. He has previously worked extensively on HIV vaccines and is considered a thought leader in the discovery and development of new vaccines. Dr. Kim has been leading IVI since 2015. Over to you, Dr. Kim. Good day to everyone. Honorable member of the National Assembly, Dr. Herr, Ambassador Jensen, Mr. Wickline, Dr. G, distinguished speakers, panelists, and guests. It is a pleasure to welcome you all today to today's dialogue on the invisible pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, engaging a global network of IVI's partners and supporters who have been at the forefront of developing solutions to this grave global health threat and communicating its urgency. In fact, IVI, RCARS, and the Embassy of Denmark in Korea hosted a webinar at this time last year, focusing on strategies for moving forward on the AMR agenda amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm pleased to co-host this year's webinar with additional partners such as ADB and IPK, Institute Pasteur Korea. In fact, now one year later, what progress and lessons learned from COVID-19, and can we apply can we apply towards a decisive multi-sectoral and united agenda for AMR? Although often prefaced by descriptors such as invisible or silent or slow or unseen to evoke its insidious spread, the AMR pandemic is no less threatening than a rapidly spreading infectious disease like COVID-19 with the potential to disrupt ways of life in all corners of the world and upend a country, a century of medical progress. In fact, in many parts of the world, there are it, countries already face the dire consequences of infectious disease outbreaks that cannot be properly treated or contained due to ineffective antibiotics, diseases such as non-typhoidal salmonella and tuberculosis that disproportionately affect low resource settings. Today, AMR accounts for approximately 700,000 deaths every year and is estimated and this is estimated to rise to 10 million deaths by 2050 if we continue the status quo. These are the startling and widely used numbers identified by the O'Neill Review on Antimicrobial Resistance to communicate the eventual toll of AMR. And yet, the international community still fails to allocate appropriate attention, resources, and urgency to address the problem or invest in its solutions. IVI and our partners today will pre present and explore some of these solutions, including the wider use of existing vaccines and the development of novel ones, new drugs to replace those that have been rendered useless by the emergence of resistance, and other measures such as high-quality AMR surveillance and the generation of actionable data to inform context-specific policy solutions. As an international organization with a mission to discover, develop, and deliver, safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health, IVI primarily focuses on vaccines that protect against infectious diseases affecting low- and middle-income countries, including those caused by AMI priority pathogens such as Group A streptococcus, typhoid, non-typhoidal salmonella, shigella, and tuberculosis. Dr. Marianne Holm, who heads IVI's Epidemiology and Public Health Research Department, will dive deeper into the role of vaccines in stopping the emergence and spread of AMR and why a One Health approach, that is, bridging the human, animal, and environmental health sectors, is cr crucial for comprehensive response to this global health threat. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for your remarks. I next invite Winfried Wicklein, Deputy Director General, Southeast Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank, for his introductory remarks. Winfried has extensive experience in development financing across the Asia Pacific region and has been with ADB for over 20 years. He was previously the country director for Indonesia and Myanmar. Over to you, Winfried Wicklein. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sakar and uh, uh, Dr. Her, Ambassador Jensen, um, Dr. Kim. 
Dr. Yi, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon and uh, very honored and uh, pleased to join uh, my previous speakers in, in very warmly welcoming you all to this important webinar on, on AMR. Um, we at the Asian Development Bank view health as an essential cornerstone of development. Good health improves learning, enhances economic growth and increases prosperity. Accordingly, we support our developing member countries in a range of health responses. Most recently, our focus has, of course, been on supporting countries in responding to the COVID crisis. To that end, we have allocated a 20 billion US dollar uh, package to help our member countries counter the severe health and economic impacts of the crisis. But of course, while COVID-19 continues to pose dire challenges uh, to countries, a host of other health threats are not abating. In fact, COVID-19 is impeding people's overall access to health services, and um, many overstretched health service providers are having to prioritize COVID-19 services at the expense of other essential he health care. Moreover, many people are also foregoing healthcare, some cases because of, because of their fear that visiting uh, medical facilities could increase their risk to uh, exposure to COVID-19, while others in Southeast Asia who are struggling economically can simply not afford the healthcare they need. So as a result, a wide range of medical services are being disrupted. This is particularly important in the case of antimicrobial resistance, the AMR impediments to quality healthcare and rising AMR rates are reducing our ability to manage bacterial and viral infections and therein increasing the threat of, of new disease outbreaks and new pandemics. As we know from the COVID situation, new outbreaks and new pandemics not only lead to increased death and illnesses, but also adversely affect economic growth and poverty reduction in the countries in the region. Hence, we, as we continue to address the ongoing pandemic, it is imperative that we simultaneously prepare Southeast Asia and indeed the whole of Asia um, to better mitigate and prevent future disease outbreaks. To help future-proof Southeast Asia from the next pandemic, we at the ADB have been supporting our developing member countries in, in strengthening disease surveillance, laboratory capacity, treatment cap uh, capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. We also um, are helping countries work together to build up regional health security cap uh, capabilities and capacities, particularly also in in Southeast Asia's uh, GMS, uh, Greater Mekong subregion, where there's quite a lot of regional cooperation ongoing between and among the countries. Given the important role of AMR reduction in preventing or mitigating future pandemics, we are also keen to explore ways of supporting both country level and region wide interventions against AMR. If we can successfully fight and lessen the impacts of AMR, we will not only help control this invisible epidemic, but we will also be preventing the next visible pandemic, which basically would be another COVID-19 crisis from happening again. So as we set out our, um, our sights on fighting AMR and COVID-19, it is important to recognize the vital role um, that universal health coverage can and should be playing. This outbreak has highlighted the need to invest in resilient systems that can maintain the provision of high quality health services with minimal disruptions, even during shocks like COVID-19. So achieving universal health coverage in the region would not only meaningfully mitigate these health risks, it will also contribute to more equitable economic growth and stability. So I'd now like to conclude my remarks by reaffirming ADB's commitment to strengthening health services, to supporting COVID-19 response, and to advancing the AMR response. We look very much forward to exploring with you ways to collaborate with the International Vaccine Institute and other partners in our joint quest to combat AMR and 
to improve the health and lives of the people in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Winfried, for your insightful remarks and reiterating the commitment of ADB to fight AMR. I now call upon Dr. Yungmi Ji, Chief Executive Officer of Institute Pasteur Korea, to offer her introductory remarks. Dr. Ji is a member of the WHO IHR Emergency Committee, as well as the Scientific Advisory Group for the Blueprint on Research and Development Preparedness for Epidemics. Dr. Ji also serves as Special Representative for Health Diplomacy with the Korea Foundation. Over to Dr. G. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my great privilege to be a part of uh, today's special webinar to collectively combat uh, antimicrobial resistance at the global level. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Danish government, International Vaccine Institute, and Asia Development Bank, especially Ambassador uh, Aina Janssen, Dr. Jerome Kim, and Mr. Winfried Wicklain for the great leadership in our efforts for stepping up the fight against antimicrobial resistance, one of our uh, most urgent health threats. I greatly appreciate Danish government initiative to establish the International, Cancer, uh, in International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, ICARS, that I believe was a great achievement during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. As you all know, WHO warned us that we are heading for a post-antibiotic era without urgent action, and do, we do need uh, collective efforts and uh, close collaboration to tackle AMR threats. I'm sure today's webinar will provide a great opportunity for sharing our expertise in AMR research, public health, and policies, as well as facilitating global collaboration. Now I want to uh, share my experience of organizing a side event on addressing antimicrobial resistance, a threat to global health and achievement of UHC during uh, 2018 World Health Assembly. This event co-hosted by Korea and Sweden provided an insight into challenges of implementation of national AMR surveillance systems experienced by Fiji, Zambia, Vietnam, Chile, and Thailand. Awareness raising and effective governance were highlighted by all five countries as both important challenges and the backbone for successful implementation of AMR national action plans. Effective and sustainable implementation of AMR national action plans will require obviously strong governance and investment supported by multi-sectoral and multi-level collaboration. And I'm sure ICAR's initiative will greatly contribute to enhancing the capacity of low and middle income countries in their efforts to control AML, especially with one health approach. I'm happy to learn ICARS has launched pilot project in Zambia and Vietnam that participated in the side event in 2018. I wish great success with those pilot projects. IPK belongs to Pastel Network and recently Pastel Network established Pastel Network Association to promote a collaborative project, capture more opportunities and boost synergies among different institutes. AMR research is one of priority areas selected by the network, especially in the uh, Asian Pacific region. And IPK and other Pastel Institute in this region already selected top priority research projects on AMR, including innovative development of new antibiotics and analysis of co community-based AMR surveillance data. In collaboration with IVI, IPK would love to link ICAS efforts to the Pasteur Network and also government of Korea. Once again, I want to thank for the opportunity to participate in uh, today's event and do hope today's presentations and panel discussion on effective AMR strategies to strengthen global and regional capacities could further boost our vision of a world where drug resistance infections no longer pose a, a threat to the health of humans, animals, and environment. Thank you. We thank you, Dr. G, and also all the other <clears throat> distinguished leaders for the insightful remarks. And now turn to our three technical experts on AMR to set the stage for discussion on tools and strategies for stopping AMR. 
Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. And after all have presented their insights, we will have a combined Q&A for 10 minutes. But please put your questions to them uh, only in the Q&A box. I now invite Dr. Marianne Holm, Senior Research Scientist at IVI to make her presentation. Marianne is a medical doctor and epidemiologist by training and currently leads the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health Research at the IVI. She's also the technical lead at IVI for two major Fleming Fund projects on AMR. Her talk today will focus on the role of vaccines in the fight against AMR. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you very much, Satya. Um, it is really an honor and a pleasure to, to have an opportunity to contribute to this webinar today. Um, as our Director General Jerome Kim just mentioned, the IVI mission is to discover, develop and deliver safe, effective and affordable vaccines for global public health. Um, we focus on diseases that disproportionately affect low and middle income settings. And as such, AMR has really become a high research priority for IVI. So today I'll talk a little bit about how we envision we can use vaccines, both in the short and long term, as an important tool to combat AMR. Um, as we've seen in the current pandemic, vaccines are critical to the prevention and control of infectious diseases and really an important tool for our global health security. The important role of infection uh, prevention in vaccines really highlighted as one of the key tools to combat AMR. Um, as was just mentioned, here at IVI, we've been engaged for a number of years already in efforts to improve the AMR uh, efforts in Asia and Africa. This has been led um, out by our UK, uh, UK government-funded Fleming Fund projects, where we have helped to build and strengthen the capacity to do AMR surveillance across Africa and Asian countries. However, uh, last year a report came out that tried to evaluate um, all of the headway that has been done so far, but also identify what are the remaining critical gaps if we want to really um, put forward or move forward in our combating AMR. And some of the critical gaps have been highlighted is really the barriers to access for existing vaccines, but also a lack in funding for development of new vaccines that can be used in the fight against AMR. There are basically different ways that vaccines can, can help reduce AMR. They can either directly reduce the incidence of disease from both sensitive and resistant pathogens, but they can also indirectly combat AMR by reducing the inappropriate antibiotic use we often see in connection with uh, viral infections. <clears throat> However, AMR is a very complex global health issue. Um, the reason being that there is no single disease or no single pathogen that we're targeting. AMR appears in dozens of different types of pathogens and, and, and also different types of infections. There are currently very few licensed vaccines that target what we call the priority pathogens. In 2017, the WHO published a priority list of pathogens, so those that are really considered to be the most important targets and those that are more likely to develop resistance and be difficult to treat. And what we see is basically very few licensed vaccines, as mentioned, but also that there is an insufficient rollout of those vaccines that are there. So that's why if we want to try and understand and, and decide how we can best employ vaccines against AMR, we need to develop strategic targets for both our vaccine development, but also the deployment against these priority pathogens. So what does this really mean? Um, in terms of strategies, if we look at the more short term, we need to make better use of the existing vaccines that there are. As mentioned before, if you look at the priority pathogens as, as identified by the WHO, there are only currently three licensed vaccines. Um, this is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the Haemophilus type B vaccine, as well as the typhoid conjugate vaccine. Here on the right, you see an example of how after employing the PCV vaccine, the rates of both regular infections, but also resistant infections uh, were markedly reduced. Another example in the short term um, has been the introduction of a typhoid conjugate vaccine. Um, here we saw last year that there was a massive outbreak of extensively resistant uh, typhoid in a region of Pakistan. And here successfully the government managed to actually develop, a, a sort of deploy vaccines to fight this outbreak. So this is a really a promising success story. Unfortunately, the rollout of typhoid vaccines are still limited. And so this is an area that's important for us to really ensure that this is more widely used so we can help uh, combat AMR this way. 
As shown on this map, IVI is committed on multiple fronts to global typhoid control efforts. Many of our efforts include introduction of TV, TCV vaccination, but also development of new vaccines um, to, to be uh, deployed against typhoid. <clears throat> Another target in the short term is also making better use of existing vaccines that prevent viral infections. So what we often see is that viral infections are often wrongly uh, treated with antibiotics. And so if we can vaccinate against these viral infections, we can reduce the misuse of antimicrobials. And we can also prevent what we call the potential secondary bacterial co-infections, which we see. Um, the available vaccines uh, that have been established or we, where we have seen they have an effect on AMR are the influenza vaccine and rotavirus vaccine. But also during this COVID pandemic, we have seen an extensive amount of antibiotic misuse to patients with COVID. Because it's a viral infection, antibiotics are not, infect, are not really useful unless they have bacterial co-infections. But since these are rare, the massive use has, has been uh, really a good indication of how we need to make sure that if we can prevent a viral vaccine with a, a viral infection with a vaccine, this is a way to reduce the inappropriate antibiotic use. <clears throat> if we try to look a little bit further and, and consider the longer term strategies, we need to also consider developing new vaccines against critical pathogens. Unfor unfortunately, if we consider all of the remaining priority pathogens as defined by the WHO, currently we have no licensed vaccines. There are several in development and proof of concept evidence suggests that it is feasible to develop vaccines, um, additional vaccines against tuberculosis, I should say, because there is already one, um, but also vaccines against gonococcal disease and other enteric infections, which see, so have a high uh, rate of resistance <clears throat> among them. Another very critical research need is to develop um, uh, vaccines against bacteria such as Acinetobacter, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas, as these are often uh, associated with hospital-acquired infections, um, where they carry a considerable treatment challenge, um, hospitalization cost, and high fatality. They, they thereby compromise the basic infection control for standard operations and cancer treatments. So this is a really critical research need, to develop vaccines against these bacteria. Um, in 2018, a landmark report evaluating the research and development opportunities for vaccines to tackle drug resistance infections um, was published. This highlights how to prioritize vaccine candidates and efforts of development. Basically considering the, the, the health impacts, such as the morbidity and mortality, and the amount of infections we see every year, as well as the feasibility based on preclinical evidence, tells us where is it we should focus and how likely are we to succeed in developing vaccines in the longer term. So here you can see on the right, in the blue, we already have those that are available. But then the next target should be those that, that follow here, the Shigella vaccine, non-typhoidal salmonella and E. coli. At, here at IVI, we're currently working on developing vaccines for TB, typhoid, non-typhoidal salmonella, as well as Shigella. And it is really our hope that in the future, we will be able to have a successful vaccine candidates that we can use in the fight against AMR. Alongside vaccine development and delivery efforts, it's also crucial to consider activities that can support these strategies in the long term. In 2020, the WHO published an action framework <clears throat> that basically tried to guide these activities. Here it is highlighted how important it is to really understand and, and be able to bridge the funding gap that currently exists for the research and development of new vaccines, but also that it's a ne necess necessity to develop regulatory and policy mechanisms to accelerate the approval and use of new vaccines. Currently, um, uh, the establishment of a WHO technical advisory group is ongoing. And these combined efforts will work to sort of help expand and share knowledge of vaccine impact on AMR. So we can also make sure we improve the methodologies and the analyses of relevant data to assess the impacts that vaccines have on AMR. Also, it's important that we develop the estimates of the full public health and socioeconomic value of vaccines against AMR, because this is really what will inform policies and convince you know, politicians and countries across the world to focus and prioritize this area. So, Basically, as a final remark, COVID-19 has shown us the destructive potential of a pandemic in our connected modern world, but it has also shown the importance of an accelerated pathway to new, safe, and effective vaccines. We really hope and encourage that we can see the same kind of innovation and investment into the development of vaccines to stop AMR. Thank you.
Thank you, Mar Marianne, for making a compelling case for uh, vaccines to fight AMR, both in the short term and the long term. I next call upon Dr. Su Jin Jiang, head of the Antibacterial Resistance Lab at the, in at, at the Institute Pasteur in Korea, which she herself established. Uh, Dr. Jiang specializes in genetic engineering and microbiology and is working with various national and international partners, including the <clears throat> Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, or GARD-P contributing her expertise to the discovery of new antibacterial molecules. Her talk today will focus on conventional and non-conventional strategies to reinforce the antibiotic arsenal. Over to you, Dr. Zhang. Well, uh, thanks for a uh, general introduction. So, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Susan Zhang. I'm leading antibacterial resistance laboratory in Institute Pasteur, Korea. So today, uh, this is my great pleasure to participate in this important webinar. And today I will talk about uh, the current effort to, to overcome the AMR, especially focusing on the uh, development strategy of uh, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic development. So, Antibiotic uh, has been considered one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Before the antibiotic era, people were suffered from various infectious diseases. But since the 1930s, antibiotics were actively developed and saving many lives, resulting in increase of average lifespan. In addition to that, Antibiotics have been considered also a foundation of modern medicines, making complicated surgical uh, procedures such as organ transplant uh, possible by reducing the risk of infection. So due to that, uh, in modern society, we are heavily rely on antibiotics, consuming tremendous amount of antibiotics in each year. But unfortunately, Inappropriate use of antibiotics, including use in agriculture, drives the emergence of drug-resistant bacteria. So for example, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, is a representative of drug-resistant bacteria. As you can see in this map, MRSA is already prevalent around the world, and even worse, MRSA is not just too resistant to methicillin, it is also resistant to many other antibiotics that are currently used in clinics. So besides that, MRSA, actually there are many pathogen bacteria are becoming multi-drug resistant. So in this uh, situation, we often these days hear tragic news regarding untreatable superbacterial infection and for new antibiotic development, all new therapeutic agents are urgently demanded in this situation. However, the antibiotic development has been really uh, insufficient until nowadays, and it is more likely neglected compared to other development of treatment for like a chronic disease such as cancer. Even worse, the bigger problem is that uh, there is no new antibiotics with novel target. Remaining, the bacteria can develop the anti, uh, antibiotic resistance more easily, even for the newly developed uh, antibiotics. So definitely, we need more new antibiotics with novel targets. And people are working very hard to, to develop the antibacterial therapeutic agent with the conventional as well as non-conventional strategies, such as reinforcing old drugs, exploring nature, applying new methods and new concepts through the global collaborations. So the first strategy is reinforcing old, old drugs. It can be done in two different ways. First one is overcoming current resistance. 
The best example would be the beta-lactonase inhibitor. They can revive uh, beta-lactams even against the uh, beta-lactamase-mediated resistant bacteria. The other example would be the uh, overcoming the intrinsic impermeability of gram-negative bacteria out, uh, outer membrane by using the sulfur conjugated antibiotics, which has been recently approved by the FDA. And the other way to reinforce the old drug is improving the defects of the old drugs. Examples could be teripenem as well as uh, SPR206. And in terms of the uh, teripenem, this is the first carbapenem that can be uh, orally available. And SPR206 is the polyps B uh, derivatives with the reduced cytotoxicity, which has been the great uh, the hurdle for the polymixins. The second strategy people are trying to apply is exploring in nature. So in fact, many of the uh, antibiotics so far are originated from the nature. So people are going back to nature these days and looking for the new entities that can be developed as a new antibiotics or treatment option. And the best, one of the best examples would be the texobactin, which is originated from the, uh, uh, the non-culturable uh, bacteria. So bacteria. And also people are uh, look at really various environments, even starting from the you know, deep sea to the microbiome in small insects. But unlike early era of the antibiotic development, in these days, the natural product has some hurdles to be developed as a new therapeutic agent due to its a little bit of difficulty for the refinement of the natural product for better efficacy, safety, as well as durability. But people are really trying hard to overcome these difficulties. So the third, uh, third strategy is the application of a new method with the cutting edge technologies. So the first example I show you is the synthetic biology. And many people are trying to use the synthetic biology to have the better entities of the antibacterial agent. For example, in this case, uh, people want to make uh, uh, active derivatives in various ways. So they use the, uh, the genetically engineered microbiomes instead of the chemical synthesis. And obviously, in this case, artificial intelligence, uh, AI is a hot uh, item for developing new antibacterial agents. Besides these advanced conventional method strategy, also people are trying to use the uh, non-conventional uh, strategy with new concept, which is uh, bacterial phase therapy, microbiome therapy, immunotherapy, antivirulence therapies. And these uh, non-conventional therapies are quite uh, these days popular and based on a recent WHO report, it is suggested that these non-conventional therapies could be quite close to the clinical usage since many of these are in the clinical development stage. But the most importantly, all these strategies should be done through global corporations. In 2016, uh, UN high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance. Since then, there are many initiatives uh, were uh, established to promote uh, development of a new therapeutic agent as well as control the antimicrobial resistance. And IPK is uh, also trying to contribute to these global efforts by working with these initiatives. IPK was established in 2004 as a member of a partner network. 
And the mission of IPK is uh, to address the global health issue by understanding disease mechanisms and uh, developing new treatment, especially focusing on infectious disease. To do so, uh, we have BSL-2 and BSL-3 facilities that are optimized for investigation of infectious disease from various uh, viral disease to parasite as well as bacterial infections. And antimicrobial uh, and antibacterial resistance laboratory, my lab is also part of this research topic. And the goal of our team is the discovery of new antibacterial molecules with novel mechanism to fight against antibiotic resistance. To do so, we start with the investigation of bacterial physiology and resistant mechanism. Based on that, we developed a unique assay that can be used for uh, new entity screening, such as the small molecules as well as the natural products. Once we identify the active molecules, we also perform the mechanism study. By doing so, we can identify the new targets as well as new molecules. With these activities, uh, currently, uh, we have eight ongoing projects targeting various gram-negative and positive uh, bacteria. And we have recently licensed out our new identified uh, antibacterial molecules to Korean pharmaceutical uh, venture company for further development. And we have over 10 domestic and international collaborators, uh, including Guard P, and we hope that um, our dedicated effort to, can contribute to promote uh, development of a new therapeutic agent against the antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, in summary, there are definitely great effort uh, to develop the antibacterial therapeutic agent in advanced conventional as well as non-conventional strategies. At this point, I don't know exactly, I'm not sure which strategy would be successful delivering tangible outcomes that can be used in clinics against the AMR. However, what I know is that we don't have a luxury time to waste, so we have to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jang, <clears throat> for this insightful uh, presentation, uh, particularly uh, the use of uh, recent use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in, for the discovery of new antibacterials. We've heard of some wonderful stories uh, and examples that have taken place indeed. Uh, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A box for the speakers. and. Some of them will be answered directly in writing by, uh, the, by, by the speakers. Uh, and I invite all speakers also to uh, look at the Q&A box and respond to some of the questions there and then itself. So we're slightly behind time, uh, but that's all right. And our final speaker for this expert session will be Dr. Robert Skov, Scientific Director of the International Center for Antimicrobial <clears throat> Resistance Solutions, or ICARS. Dr. Scove is a medical doctor and clinical microbiologist by training and spent much of his career at the Staten Serum Institute in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, working on epidemiology and infection control of drug resistance pathogens. He has headed several reference labs and has co-authored over 200 publications. Robert's talk will focus on moving evidence into action through partnerships to tackle AMR in low and middle income countries. Over to you, Dr. Scove. Thank you very much, Satya, for, for this kind introduction. Uh, dear organizers, dear Dr. Her, G, and Kim, Mr. Winkelheim, and Ambassador Jensen, it's really an honor to speak here today on the evidence to action on partnering to tackle antimicrobial resistance in low and middle income countries. Sorry. So, yeah, okay. So, um, AMR is a highly complex uh, problem which has already been uh, alluded to by Dr. Holm. And 
as you can see here in as illustrated here in this uh, picture uh, which shows the AMR systemic map which is interlinking humans animals and the environment it is clear that AMR respects neither sectors nor borders but Furthermore, AMR is not only complex, it actually comprises a super wicked problems where country development inevitably will increase the use of antibiotics and thereby selection pressure. That those seeking to solve the problems are partly the cause of the problem. And not least, that in several countries, the lack of access to antibiotics causes more death than in a infections due to AMR bacteria. So what needs to be done? First of all, as been speaking to by the previous speakers, we definitely new, need new antibiotics and new vaccines. However, if we don't protect what we already have, this will not help anything. So we need to develop strategies for rational use as well as for IPC and biosecurity. There has been a massive uh, amount of, um, of uh, research already, which has been looking into AMR mitigations. However, even very successful interventions has to a very little scale been implemented outside of, of these investigations. And here is, is shown a couple of issues why this is so. First of all, Many times there's a lack of political or policy commitment. There is a, no connections between the policy level and the um, university and research level who is developing uh, the mitigation actions. There's a poor understanding on the consequences of AMR, and there is a lack of a convention business model or return of investment of these. Even for those, there is very often a lack of local ownership, engagement, or behavioral change from stakeholders for several reasons. Again, suboptimal knowledge, attitude, and practices on AMR and its consequences, as well as a lack of acknowledgement of the importance for implementation research to get sustained change. And not the least, even when that is uh, acknowledged, that there is a lack of capacity in implementation research. So in order to make scalable, successful interventions, these needs to be based on research that both has an interventions as well as an implementation component. When developing truly sustainable needs, Several issue, several things are needed, including political will, ownership throughout the whole stakeholder chain. These needs to be context specific. There needs to be context, country capacity to develop it. There is a need to understand why people are doing what they are. Otherwise, you cannot change their behavior. And not the least, these issues need to be measures needs to be cost effective. So ICARS was initiated in, by the Danish government after a talks with the World Bank in order to uh, assist low and middle income countries in making the bridge from policy papers and laps into real AMR mitigation. So the mission of ICARS is to partner with LMICs as, and thereby co-creating and co-developing AMR interventions that generate solutions for sustainable scale-up. And we do this in a funded partnerships between government and researchers in those uh, LMICs. Obviously, these uh, measures need to be evidence-based, cost-effective, context-specific, and covering the whole One Health spectrum in order to cover, uh, to close the gap between policy and practice. We also need to use holistic and cross-sectoral research approaches in order to tackle these complex issues. ICARS works uh, in four different pillars. We are testing solutions in a 
together with LMICs uh, and thereby generating evidence for sustainable solutions. We're trying to, in Pillar 2, to do translation of evidence where we are supporting translation of already existing evidence into policies, programs, and practices. The third pillar is advocacy, where we are advocating for AMR mitigation in general, but not the least, AMR in mitigation by using implementation research. And not uh, last but not least, we are doing targeted capacity and capability building in low and middle income countries in order to make AMR uh, championships and to create a milieu for sustainable changes. ICAST believe in a partnership model, which is a mix of a top-down and a bottom-up engagement with the LMICs, which secures the commitment from the very top ministerial level. That means that we in initially initiate our talks with the government and the diplomatic levels, ensuring that uh, what we are doing is building of the country's NAPs. And then we turn it bottom up and engage with local researchers, both to understand the context, but also to develop um, the interventions. Not the least, we also look into if other players is on the ground there in order to build on existence instead of just duplicating any efforts. Here you see an example of what we have been, one of the first projects that we have been initiating. This is in Vietnam, where the problem was overuse of antibiotics in pig production, especially the critical and important antibiotic colistin. The project is to reduce the use of colistin in the pig production by alternatives, for instance, vaccination using less critical antibiotics or zinc oxides. And we have then done this in close collaborations with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, medium to large scale farms, as well as veterinarians. And the expected output is that we can show that the and create evidence for a reduction of the colistin use in this demonstration project, which Vietnam then can take on and make into a sustainable change. Right now, we have um, two uh, uh, approved projects. We have seven more projects, which is in co-development. And as you can see on this slide here, we have further projects, which is in early stages. And we also have what we call supporting projects uh, going on in several countries. As you also can see here on this slide, we are working across the world in all countries where they are on the OECD um, list of ODAC countries. We do not do this alone. We work very closely together with the WHO, FAO, OIE, UNIP, the World Bank, Wellcome Trust, and several other um, initiatives, both international and national networks, and research institutions um, and uh, the private sectors. And here I want to mention IVI, CEDRIC, uh, the CG system and the UK Fleming Fund and GAMRIF. And uh, lately we joined the Joint Programme for Initiative for AMR to secure that low and middle income countries could actually participate in this European uh, research uh, funding. I want to end with an invitation both to LMIC governments to come together with us and co-development AMR mitigations to high income countries and charity funds to join us uh, as uh, founding and supporting members and not the least other organizations with the aligned um, initiatives as ours and goals uh, to complement our efforts. So with these uh, words, I would like to thank all of you for your attention and, um, and stop here. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, thank you, Robert. Thank you for your very insightful presentation, and especially uh, the focus on um, focusing on Im implementation research and implementation science to really find context-specific solutions. Uh, we're running about 10, 12 minutes behind schedule. So if all the speakers and the participants would indulge me, I'll push ahead with the next session. However, we have one or two questions in the Q&A box, which I invite uh, the speakers, Marianne, Robert, and Dr. Jang, uh, to look at that and perhaps uh, respond in writing. Uh, that might uh, uh, allow us to play a bit of a catch-up game. So if the speakers don't mind, I would like to move on to the next uh, session, which is a panel discussion. So we do thank all the experts for the insightful presentations. Now for the third and final part of this webinar, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Eduardo Banzon, uh, Principal Health Specialist, Southeast Asia Department, Asian Development Bank, to moderate the panel discussion on effective strategies to strengthen global, regional, and local capacities and capabilities to tackle AMR in LIMIX. Dr. Eduardo is a distinguished health economist and a, a passionate champion of universal health coverage. He has been an advisor uh, in health economics and financing to WHO EMBRO, WHO Bangladesh, and to the World Bank. Eduardo will introduce the distinguished panelists and lead the 20-minute session, which will be followed by a 20-minute Q&A, and hopefully we'll be able to keep to time. Meantime, please, speakers, if you could respond to some of the questions in writing, it would be great. Thank you. Over to Eduardo. Uh, thanks a lot, Satyajit. It's been quite uh, interesting listening to the discussion. Uh, we now have four experts who will be talking about uh, regional, global, and country-level experience on how they have implemented interventions like an AMHR. I would like the speakers, our panelists, to sort of reflect also on the wonderful presentations that was discussed earlier on the need for vaccines against AMR new antibiotic uh, mechanisms, and of course, partnership. We in ADB has been supporting uh, one part of the efforts against AMR, in particular, One Health interventions in East, in East Asia, in, our, in part of what we call the Greater Mekong Sub System, which we have been uh, investing a lot on One Health. My colleagues, Najib and Ricard, has been doing a lot of work there, and we actually will be coming out soon with a publication on One Health, on the work that ADB has done. We have also partnered with NOSAL, among others, to support our countries there, uh, investing in One Health intervention. So as we listen to our panel and to our, our experts earlier, we will really be quite excited to see what more we in ADB can do to support the effort of uh, IVI, RCARS, and all of the others who have been uh, championing and working against AMR. Of course, this is just mature in Korea. So our panelists will start with our first one, uh, Gloria Cristina Cordoba Correa, hopefully I got your pronunciation right, is the advisor for anti antimicrobial resistance in ICARS. She's a medical doctor with ex extensive experience on research on One Health. Uh, this is, she has also worked in Brazil. So Gloria, may we'd like to hear about your experience in implementing, supporting the implementation of AMR interventions in Brazil, regionally and globally. We have five minutes, Gloria. Yes, thank you. So, um, thank you for the invitation. And uh, today I'm telling you, first of all, is about the uh, ICARS approach, about uh, strengthening capacity building and, uh, and the tools to uh, how we are uh, pushing the agenda of antimicrobial resistance solutions and our strategies. So, um, as you saw in the previous presentation from Robert, uh, uh, strengthening capacity building is one of our main pillars. And it's important for uh, all of you to understand that actually all uh, uh, capacity building is practically a cross-cutting uh, issue across all our pillars. So our approach to uh, of uh, working uh, is um, ensuring that all the elements of strengthening capacity building are developed inside the different projects. So as part of uh, this um, uh, systematic approach, um, 
we have to take into consideration that these uh, the, uh, the four main um, dimensions of capacity building. Uh, we, uh, I will give you an example of how we implement these uh, four dimensions of capacity building, uh, institutional capacity, human resources capacity, financial capacity, and uh, program capacity. Uh, mainly that uh, our entry, as, uh, as you saw in the previous presentation, our main point of entry is that we work on implementing solutions that are relevant are specific and specific for the national action class. Uh, what is the most important, uh, the important part of the, the, that they are relevant of the national action plan that ICAR's uh, vision or uh, um, important approach for a uh, capacity building is that we are building local capacity building that will be reflected in regional and then global. But our main um, um, objective is to uh, strengthen the local the local capacity. So, for example, right now we have a, a project uh, that we recently started in Georgia, and with this project, I will just give you uh, the examples of how we are uh, approaching the different elements of uh, capacity building. So, this project in Georgia is a pro is a project where we are. Um, uh, supporting the implementation of an antimicrobial stewardship program for improving the use of antibiotics uh, for surgical uh, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, in hospitals uh, in Georgia. And uh, so our working approach for supporting the different areas of capacity building is that, for example, to secure institutional, institutional capacity building, we have been supporting the uh, the process of bringing the different uh, stakeholders together to, ha to, uh, to have the professional associations, the, academic, uh, the academics in Georgia, the hospital, uh, the hospital management, and the Ministry of Health together to uh, start talking and getting to know about the antimicrobial resistance problems and, the dif and discussing the different uh, priorities and how they need to tackle the problem. So here, uh, the way we are building institutional um, institutional capability is uh, facilitating the dialogue between the different the different actors, being sure that, for example, the uh, at the at the hospital level, the not only the clinicians but administrators as well are supporting and are aware that it's important to allocate human resources, to allocate uh, financial resources in order to have a sustainable program running. Uh, the, uh, the other, um, another uh, point for the development of this uh, capacity building, uh, development of human resources, uh, as part of this uh, program uh, specifically, uh, we have joined forces with the, the British Society, um, uh, the BCA, in order to uh, develop a program, BISAC, sorry, uh, in order to develop an antimicrobial stewardship program, uh, open access online, but with the new future, like, no, you, you know that normally the MOOCs are. Uh, are actually developed to be general in order to capture a wide audience. But in this type of uh, general programs are not really, uh, really engaging the, lo uh, the locals. And when you cannot see how this uh, specific problem or knowledge can be used in your context, the learning and the use of the learning is not really effective. So we are in the process of creating a program that will be like different pieces of antimicrobial stewardship where some general models can be used in different countries and then sorry and then um, a specific models are prepared for the local for this the for the local context so there's a, there will be models that are only uh, regarding uh, i sorry have problems with the video uh, let's try again. Yeah, no, no, it's not working. No, no. 
Okay, so this um, so this content uh, will be the um, will be only um, it will be target content for the country on the specific lines of those countries, the specific uh, prevalence of antimicrobial resistance, uh, the specific uh, um, antibiotics that are available in this country. So this knowledge becomes relevant for the locals and obviously they can do something and act upon. Um, as part of all our projects for the financial capacity building, all our projects are actual, actually are uh, mixed methods projects. In a basic, uh, a basic structure of uh, an ICARS project is that has uh, a intervention and implementation research methodology plus um, an uh, economic analysis and a, qu a qualitative approach. Uh, so normally for the, the economic analysis, in this case, specifically for Georgia, we will have this, um, uh, this economic, uh, the, the cost-benefit analysis to see if the use of quality improvement uh, methodology as part of the implementation research approach is uh, how can be sustainable, sustainable along uh, in, the, in the long term. Uh, and finally, the uh, supporting the program, the the program capacity is again is to make you aware that one of the main points of uh, ICARS developing a, developing a project is to be sure uh, is to have a good context analysis where we know that they they are relevant for a solutions for the specific national action plan. Uh, I think I have <laughs> I have already used more than my five minutes, but I'm very happy to answer more more questions and to uh, and to talk more about all the different uh, projects on capacity, how we are opera operationalizing capacity building. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gloria. Uh, and you you did provide some uh, comprehensive interventions, and I think one area which you find interesting as ADB is the country level information and not just country level information on AMR prevalence, but also on economic costs. I think this is something we should be talking much more uh, on how yes. we could provide this information to our member countries in ADB. Now we'll be talking with the uh, expert who has been supporting one of our member countries in uh, South mm -hmm. Asia, in Bangladesh. Well, Georgia is also part of ADB. Natish Debnat he is the Fleming Fund country grant uh, Team leader. He is Dai Global Health uh, of Bangladesh. He's a veterinarian and a member of the One Health High Level Expert Panel constituted by FAO, OA, OAI, WHO, and UNEP. May we have uh, Nitesh, please? So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice introduction. And I have been listening to our previous uh, uh, speakers. I would like to focus on two issues, you know, as far as strategies are concerned, we hear a lot of uh, important examples about the strategies. And in the context of Nassim, uh, particularly in the context of Bangladesh, I would like to share with you uh, two important strategies that we are trying to implement in Bangladesh. And one is to, uh, you know, establish a sound evidence base to support development of uh, strategy and materials for advocating to stakeholders for policy decision as well as uh, resource mobilization to contain AMR, for which we have conducted a political economy analysis. And I would like to highlight this point as well. Secondly, we would like to uh, you know, introduce an, uh, clinical engagement to tackle AMR. Uh, these two strategies are very uh, you know, important for uh, country level solutions. One of the things that we are doing is the political economy analysis, and we have already conducted with the support of Fleming Fund Country Grant. We have uh, conducted a political economy analysis for MR containment to identify the key stakeholders, uh, including the decision makers, influencers, assess their knowledge, priorities, and motivation to support ERC. Secondly, we identify stakeholder resources available to 
support implementation of the national action plan, not only the government, the private sector, as well as the development partners. And also we try to determine the value for money of investment in AMR containment, and also to identify factors that could influence the sustainability of AMR containment activities and to identify key issues and messages that may be considered for developing AMR advocacy strategy tools and communication materials. Currently, uh, Bangladesh is uh, revising its uh, AMR containment strategy, and it will be for another five years. And these studies you know, have clearly shown that it is not only the government, although at the moment, a uh, government is making the uh, major investment, almost uh, sort of, uh, you know, more than uh, 50% or well, nearly 60% uh, investment on the AMR containment is coming from the government, and 41 or 42 percent are coming from uh, the development partners. But we are yet to really engage uh, the private sector, who are also very much active in Bangladesh, as you know, particularly the pharmaceutical industries are very active in Bangladesh. So we are making a very strong advocacy based on this study, how a strong advocacy can really influence in, uh, you know, uh, in the containment program of Bangladesh. Secondly, we are also invest, you know, of, you know, identifying the investments, offering good value for money, in particular the infection, uh, infection prevention control maintaining hygiene against sanitation, and also the vaccination program that has been talked uh, very nicely and elegantly, assessing the quality of microbial laboratory services, and finally the regulation and enforcement of pharmaceutical production and marketing, and in particular marking the reserve group of antibiotics as a uh, signal for danger associated with them. So this, you know, this PA study has given a sort of uh, very important inputs uh, to the government, to the policymakers, where should they invest, how can they really engage the private sector as well as uh, the uh, development partners and making forward in uh, for effective uh, you know, containment program. So this is one thing that I uh, just mentioned. Second one is the importance of clinical engagement for MR. This is very important thing sometimes we ignore these things and for improved patient clinical outcomes, optimize the cost of care, contain AMR, enhance utilization of laboratory service and improve results. And for that things, you know, we are developing a sort of strategy based on national coordination. In particular, the hospital level strategy. Somebody says, you know, the local the lack of local ownership. This is a very important thing that hospital level engagement with particular strategy, how you can really contain AMR is very important. Effective clinical engagement through key entry points and as an AMR containment. And for that things, you know, we are focusing on the hospitals, including engaging all the stakeholders, doctors, nurses, uh, laboratories, pharmacies, and IPC workers. Uh, this is a sort of, uh, you know, integrated approach at the hospital level both at the tertiary as well as at the uh, you know uh, general, general hospital levels. This is an approach that we are making based on some studies that you know also we are focusing on uh, the you know the stewardship. Main focuses are this uh, stewardship, diagnostic stewardship, antibiotic use stewardship, and as well as the IPC stewardship. And these studies basically also uh, based on some metrics for success and both covering all these uh, focuses, diagnostic, antibiotic use, and IPC. And before we go to this uh, you know, approach, we, have, we undertook some studies, what we call the point prevalence studies in the hospitals, as well as in the, uh, you know, in a one health lens, in the uh, poultry farm, as well as in the, say, you know, aquaculture farms. And we identified that, you know, this study has estimated that the prevalence of antimicrobial uses in the hospitals, in the healthcare units, and also the use, uh, we used a mobile telephone survey, how communities are using antibiotics. And also we estimated the prevalence of antibiotic use in commercial chicken and aquaculture. 
and to identify the factors related to antimicrobial usage in commercial chicken and aquaculture, and then to identify MR bacteria and antibiotic residue in layer in chicken and associated factors. And this uh, study basically established that how indiscriminate use of antibiotics, both in the hospital level as well as the farm levels, are happening. And for that reason, uh, one of the important components is to make a clinical engagement and also the interface between the clinicians as well as the hospitals. These are very important. Now, our sector coordination committees, as well as the national technical committee uh, in Bangladesh for AMR containment, are strongly pursuing to follow a strong linkage between the laboratories as well as uh, with the clinician for providing effective antibiotic uh, uh, prescription at the country level. And of course, uh, these studies also uh, uh, develop, uh, you know, evidences that uh, how what sort of, uh, how antibiotic indiscriminate selling in the pharmacies are happening across human health, animal health, and aquaculture. And for that thing, rules and regulation needs to be modified and implemented. I think this is what I wanted to say in these two uh, strategy documents that we are developing on the basis of uh, direct evidence in the country level. Over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nitish, and for the uh, comprehensive discussion of what you're doing right now in Bangladesh, building the building partnerships again and work and the work on the uh, in a, to stop the inappropriate use of antibiotics, not just in hospitals but also uh, outside hospitals. Our third panelist uh, is Song Kian Han. He's the director of the Division of Disease Control Policy of the Ministry of Health and Welfare of the Republic of Korea. He's also re he is responsible for tackling AMR and searching for effective strategies against a AMR in the Republic of Korea. Dr. Han, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Han Gyunan. I'm so glad to participate in this webinar on combating uh, antimicrobial resistance as a panelist. I heard this webinar. In this webinar today, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to present on AMI strategies of Korea. Above all, I, I would like to give you a brief summary on Korea's second strategy on AMI established this November. Especially, I'll introduce the effort Korea is making to contribute to global and regional response. Korea's average antibiotic consumption in 2019 was 26.1 defined daily dose, ranking itself at third out of the 29 OECD countries. Through the measures so far, the numbers on the prescription rate for upper respiratory infection and preoperative pres prescription rate are showing improvement. However, the use of broader spectrum antibiotics has increased and inappropriate prescribing of antibiotics is still common. Although we are keeping in track of the total use of antibiotics and antibiotic prescription rate for major diseases, there is still an absence of a mechanism that performs close and systematic monitoring. Also, Korea's non-human antibiotic usage is much higher than that of other countries. And Korea use of critically important antibiotics designated by WHO is an, at an upward trend. The re resistant rate of antibiotics and use to used on antibiotic resistant bacteria is also increasing. Overall, long-term care hospitals have a higher resistance rate than general hospitals. Korea's first strategy on antibiotics was introduced in 2016 and was implemented until 2020. During that period, the Korean government has shown improvement in the field of infection prevention measures of hospitals the demand for more infection specialists and the standard on the facility in medical institutions. Korea has also established the multi-drug resist resistance bacteria surveillance system, COBLAS, which modeled its manuals after that of WHO glass. The second strategy included two main policies to control AMR. 
prevent the um, emergence of antibiotic resistance bacteria from misusing antibiotics. Secondly, control and prevent the spread of emerging antibiotic resistant bacteria and gene. Korea will also be focusing on devising measures for small and medium sized hospitals that are lagging behind in the appropriate use of antibiotics and control of infection. I talk about main contents on the second strategy against AMR. For the control of AMR in humans, animals, and environment, Korea has introduced nine initiatives on the five sector areas, including appro appropriate use of antibiotics, preventing the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria, strengthening surveillance system, expanding R&D, and so on. By concentrating on adopting the antimicrobial stewardship program, A ASP, and supporting and managing small and medium-sized hospitals along with long-term care hospitals. Korea is planning to interlink ASP with the antibiotic resistant to bacteria surveillance, surveillance system. There is also a need for the integrated management of human and non-human antibiotic usage to lay foundation for the integrated management. Korea will be proactively investing in cross-ministerial R&D collaboration and seek uh, supporting future policies. Lastly, I uh, talk about uh, in international cooperation. Korea will continue to participate in GLASS led by the WHO. It will also continue to participate in the AMR surveys by WHO, OIE, FAO, and to build a global database on animal antibiotics use supervised by OIE. In addition, Korea plans to keep hosting and participating in the AMR rated international conference and supporting international activities of AMR expert. As Korea Ministry of Food and Drug Safety was designated as the WHO Collaboration Center for Antimicrobial Resistance in 2021, Korea is planning to aid countries with insufficient AMR surveillance capability. Also, Korea is planning to aid six countries in Asia and Central and South America with their food originate AMR management system and strengthen their capability through the business agreement. Today, I have talked about uh, Korea measures against AMR. The Korean government will continuously consult with other nations so that Korea's policy efforts do not overlap with other efforts and supplement them. I hope various productive discussions take place going forward in order to resolve the AMR issues. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Han, uh, for the discussions on what Korea has been doing against AMR. So finally, we'll have our last panelist. We'll have Nitima Supradet. She's the head of Systems Research and Development Unit of the Food and Drug Administration of Ministry of Public Health of Thailand. She's also the national focal point for Thailand's National Strategic Plan on AMR. Uh, Nitima? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Um, I'm wondering, do you, hear, uh, do you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you that for having me here today to share the perspective at the country level. I will share the um, uh, experience from Thailand. Uh, I think that all we know that in 2015, the world are united. You, the world is united to combat with the AMR under the Global Action Plan on the AMR. Thailand also one of the partner to join the force. Uh, to see more information, you can go to the, our publication in 2017 that we published about the development process of the, our national action plan. And also uh, this year, we just uh, published another publication about the ex implementation experience about the NAC MR implementation. So most of my talk will go from these two articles. Uh, this is the picture of the 
uh, the Thailand National Strategic Plan on the MR, we have five goals to achieve to reduce MR morbidity and reduce uh, antimicrobial consumption in human and animals. We have six strategies to achieve that goal uh, to um, uh, implement this uh, national plan. We have the governance mechanism that we have the National Policy Committee on the MR chaired by the Deputy Prime Minister. This committee enabled the, the collaboration across uh, ministries and multi-partners. And also we have another arms we call is technical arms. We get the funding from the WHO country collaborate change strategy on MR program to generate evidence to support the implementation of the NAP MR. This show the uh, interim result that we have been uh, doing for the last four or five years for the MR morbidity. I think uh, it's the, uh, the mixed result is depend on the MR pathogen, some increase and some decrease of the trend. For the reduction of antimicrobial consumption in human and animal, we found a significant decrease after implementation of the plan, but the public awareness on AMR slightly improved. This is some key achievements that we have done so far on the AMR surveillance under the Panhill approach. Before the plan, we high of work in the silo health ministry and agriculture ministry. We have not uh, joined the effort. But after the plan, we set, uh, we developed the, an integrated surveillance of MR under the one health approach, where three ministry, health ministry, agriculture ministry, and environmental ministry joined force to standardize the list of selected uh, resistant pathogen to be collected and standardize their protocol of surveillance. Uh, this is some more of the achievements that we have done so far in terms of uh, the regulation of antimicrobial distribution in Thailand. By law, antibiotics doesn't uh, need to be prescription drug. So uh, we are aware that this is a loophole for the regulation. So we apply the, the WHO aware concept together with another criteria to set out that uh, some important antibiotics should be uh, strengthening and upgraded to be a prescription drug both in human and animal. And also we work on the antimicrobial content, anti MR containment in the human sector. We separate the OPD and the I IPD. For the OPD outpatient department, we uh, focus on reducing unnecessary use of antibiotics in uh, common illness. And we found that after implementing the plan, is that the trend of prescription is going down. For the IPD, it's more complicated. So we introduced the concept of integrated MR management in hospital where the IPC and the microbial stewardship and laboratory can work together. For the non-human sector like animals and agriculture, uh, we ally our effort with the codex and also international trade regulation. We prohibit the use of antimicrobiotics as a growth promoter and also initiate the, uh, the project rest without antibiotics to be the to produce the meat product as an alternative uh, product for the consumer. For the governance mechanism, uh, we use the JE for the IHR as a benchmark and also rely on the political declarations that we have been commit so far. So uh, in the last four or uh, four or five years, we have learned that elevating MR to the high level visibility and establishing the national governance mechanism should be done at the early stage to enable the multi uh, multi-sectoral collaboration under the one year approach. And we learned that the pace of implementation vary across organizations is depend on um, their, uh, their uh, perceived of the ownership and their prioritization of MR 
against other issue on their mandate. And the M&E platform should be developed in parallel with implementation so we can know the progress and the, the, whether we are in the right track. And lastly, we, you can see that Thailand has set a very ambitious goal at the beginning, uh, but we think that as long as it's measurable, it can advance our uh, action beyond our expectation. So we have come into challenge in the next five years ahead because there, is a, there are changes in the policy context due to the COVID-19 and there are a lot of change going on in terms of the political commitment, the budgeting, the human resources. The fragmentation of data and database is a very difficult situation in European countries, especially for Thailand. We have the difficult time to establish the M&A system. Nevertheless, we managed to do that. The R&D and the alternatives against AMR, because in Thailand, we, we are not an R&D country. So what we can do right now is to preserve the effectiveness of antibiotics as long, uh, as long as possible. And we hope that the global policy coherence and support, especially in the environmental area, should be clear and not remain conceptual. Uh, we need a concrete action to, to guide the action at the national level. So the conclusion is that so far, uh, Thailand has aligned uh, our action with the global and regional action in terms of the policy, political commitment, and also international regulation and standard. We have uh, addressed the key shortcomings in the past because before the National Action Plan on the MR, Thailand has addressed MR for many decades, but we are in a fragmented action. So uh, due to the NAP MR, we can build the strong multi-sectoral collaboration under the One Health approach, and we can generate the evidence to guide the policy decision. And right now we are in a transition period that we are going to end the first, the NAP MR next year, and we are in the transition to develop a new or the second NAP MR for the next five years. Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. Uh, th thanks a lot, Nitima. Uh, okay, we're, again, we are a little bit... Uh, late. So uh, this is what we'll do. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have, uh, in a sense, a uh, couple of questions and I probably would ask all of the panelists to respond to that. You could pick uh, one, uh, uh, one or both of the questions. I really appreciate if we have a short response. So in a sense, the first question that was asked by the audience is, you know, and this is particular for Korea and uh, Thailand. You know, what 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 was the first thing? So, uh, what 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 was it? What was it that allowed uh, the governments of both Korea and Thailand to to to, in, to implement to invest in implementing EMR? In a sense, uh, this is probably also a question that we should be asking uh, uh, in Bangladesh and uh, and the experience of. Uh, Gloria, in dealing with in dealing with other countries. You know? So, what what would be the strategies that that uh, what that would you that you would that, that have you have seen work in getting governments to invest in AMR? The second question, and uh, it, would, it would be nice to have this separate, but I think we're short for time. Well, so, to what extent is the ongoing COVID nineteen pandemic uh, affecting both in a positive or a negative manner? Uh, including the massive investment we're seeing in the health sector, including in vaccination uh, with the AMR efforts. Is it crowding out? Is it uh, an opportunity to really expand uh, AMR interventions? We'll start with Gloria. Hey, thank you, Eduardo. So the short answers that we have yeah. a short time. So for the first question, uh, as, I, as I told you, the strategy, and as Robert told, the strategy of ICARS is really to secure a policy-making commitment. 
And this is and actually our main strategy is to facilitate the dialogue between the policymakers, the, academ the, ac the academia, uh, the clinicians, the different stakeholders. So they finally understand each other. They understand what are the needs uh, of, uh, of each other. And then it's possible to build up and uh, to start building up together. Uh, this is uh, actually the the, the strategy behind uh, to, uh, taking this uh, um, bottom up and uh, up to down approach. Uh, and for the second question, actually, uh, the COVID nineteen, we can see the COVID nineteen pandemic as a, as a great opportunity. Like we in, at, at the antimicrobial resistant area, we've been for decades advocating about uh, inter, uh, infection prevention and control, um, uh, vaccines, uh, different aspects that the, the population, the, the white audience and policymakers were not really aware that they were not really grasping. And uh, one of the very few things, of course, this pandemic has uh, uh, bring about is the fact that now everybody really recognizes and understands the importance of uh, of uh, really implementing because the there's the guidelines about uh, infection prevention and control have been developed the the guidelines how to implement these in the healthcare facilities at the community level are there but before money and resources have never been really given it was like the like the less important part of uh, any type of um, infection infection, uh, infection control strategy. So right now, actually, we are in a in a once in a time opportunity to really have resources and have all the all the 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 opportunities to really implement something that is effective and is impactful. Um, and and of course. The other, the, this bad side of the coin is that always resources are uh, co competing. So uh, uh, we actually have uh, received um, some governments uh, saying like th th there's not this, um, they are like focused on uh, only uh, on, on the pandemic on how to deal with the, with the urgency of the pandemic and they, they, have not clear right now the big picture that actually antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobial resistance actions are actually part and and do not necessarily need to compete on uh, budget uh, resources. Yeah. Thanks, Dory. Yes. Very nice points. And Nitesh, your views from Bangladesh. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I know I agree with uh, our previous uh, responder, but I also would like to add one point. You know, politicians, policymakers. Uh, you know, always would like to see the evidence where investment can work. And that is why a sort of political economic analysis will be a great support for obtaining, uh, you know, support for antimicrobial containment uh, strategies. One important addition that I would like to make here, let's say, for example, our Honorable Prime Minister is now the co-chair for uh, global leaders of AMR containment. And because of her uh, ownership for that thing, I can see the increase of the investment in this area. Over the last one or two years, uh, we have seen that our operational budget for antimicrobial containment has increased quite a lot. That is why, you know, our study shows that, you know, even the government in, uh, investment uh, is uh, more than the development partners like World Bank, even Asian Development Care is doing something in Bangladesh, USAID and other organizations. So this is one positive thing. Second important point is that, you know, evidence is very important also for the uh, professional people. As I have shown you in, in our study in the PPA, you know, point prevalence studies that we have conducted in Bangladesh, we shared it with our clinician at the hospital setup, and we shown to them, look, how you are using the antibiotics. One time, you know, one patient, three antibiotics in a one day, uh, that has been shown to them. 
And it was a discussion among them. And what we are showing them, which is not only uh, the discredit of their uh, uses or prescription, but what we are showing to them that if they are really engaged in this process and also get the proper antibiotic sensitivity test results, they can avoid the indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And they have come to a sort of agreement, you know, in one medical college hospital, we shared our result to them. And they are loudly saying that, yes, we got to know this evidence. And then really, uh, you know, the local administrators can take a sort of measures of engaging the clinicians and connecting them with the laboratories, as well as uh, develop some sort of, uh, you know, protocols, uh, you know, based on the uh, laboratory test results. Uh, a sort of antimicrograms, you know, which will guide them for using antibiotics. So these are the two points that I would like to make. It is not only strategy that you want. If you do not want to show the evidence, people are reluctant to change their behavior. And that is why a strong advocacy on the basis of the uh, evidence is very important. Over. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is appropriate use of antibiotic, appropriate information. Is also important. Uh, Sankyun, how about in Korea? What what motivated uh, the government to invest in AMR? Sorry. Uh, I'm not sure I could uh, meet your uh, question uh, detail in detail. So uh, the this is the second uh, national strategy now. So uh, we have seen a uh, good performance. Uh, during that period, or uh, uh, bad performance, but uh, the AMI strategies uh, uh, spread over other uh, ministry. So the, my ministry and, K and KCDC will review the action plan and execution status of a program, and the review will the uh, review will be done by gathering the results of a core indicator and progress indicators of initi initiatives, and we also operate to a uh, national forum to uh, monitor implementation like that. So it is very concrete uh, uh, implementation method. And, and then other uh, about that, the COVID-19, uh, COVID so we are uh, in uh, the action plan is uh, uh, not, uh, not prospective because uh, uh, Korean government to uh, invest uh, uh, every uh, resource to protect COVID-19. So it is the, the, the AM and action plan is relatively uh, not a good resources. So, so we have to uh, we have to make uh, some implement, implementation plan to uh, engage other sectors to uh, invest more uh, resources. That's why I'm uh, understanding your question. That's all. I think you, Sankyo, and I think your point that uh, clear performance metrics, uh, me clear measurements, uh, well, in a sense, performance will get you more into uh, government supporting and investing in AMR. Finally, Nitima, story in Thailand. Uh, how did Thailand put more money into AMR? I think uh, uh, if you go back to the 2000, uh, 2015, that the GAP-MR was endorsed by the WHA. During that time, there is a lot of momentum at the, at the global level, right, to uh, put effort to drive MR to the global agenda. Uh, with that opportunity, Thailand has been engaged actively with the international partners and the global action to uh, develop the global action plan on the MR, we are advocate at that moment. And then they come to the 2016 that they have uh, the UN uh, assembly that endorsed political commitment on the MR, which is the really high level. Our prime minister was the chair of the group of J77. Uh, uh, and uh, he delivered the remark or the MR in that uh, in in at the UNGA, so I think that is uh, create the the turning point that become the uh, government agenda, and then afterward uh, the political commitment has been translated 
and to national level and set the national committee on the AMR and etc. to uh, to carry on the NAP AMR. That's why I said that in the next five years, when the political context or the policy concept context has been changed because of the new emerging uh, disease or situation, how we how can we still maintain or sustain the MR momentum like in the previous time? Over to you. Thanks a lot, Nitima. Uh, so we need so in a sense, there's really a lot of great stories that's happening in countries right now. Uh, there's also new work that was discussed earlier on how vaccines and new uh, interventions against antibiotics, uh, against bacteria, would help us towards MR. We'd like to thank the panel, uh, Gloria, Sangyu, Nitish, and Nitima, for the wonderful uh, presentations and for your wonderful insights. Sajaya, over, uh, sorry. <laughs> over to you. Sa uh, Satyajit, sorry. I have to apologize. I'm I'm having a bad uh, allergic attack. So I make sure that I will not take any antibiotic for my allergy right after this <laughs> session. <laughs> Good show. Satya, yeah. 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 Satya is fine. That's my, that's my short name anyway. This has been a phenomenally rich discussion, both the, uh, the, the, the technical sessions earlier and this panel discussion. Um, it's, it's, it's too bad that we, sh we didn't have more time for, for more discussion and Q&A, but it's always like this. It's a process. Um, I would just like to make one or two points myself, uh, if it's okay with you, Eduardo, and then we can proceed to wrap up, even though some questions will be left unanswered. One, uh, a very interesting person once told me, politicians don't read, or they don't know how to read, but they definitely know how to count. So it's it's critically important that that in some form or the other, we always show them numbers, whether how much it's going to cost them or how much our cost of inaction, uh, how much is the investment required or the cases, how many lives can be saved, etc. So it's very important to get those numbers. That's one. The second is all the panelists especially, and including Robert with, uh, with, uh, with, with the story about ICARS and others, has clearly shown that um, Country ownership is critical. Country ownership is critical, and we need to uh, build that. Now, I, I want to make one point, you know, uh, uh, listening to Dr. Nitima, uh, even about five years ago, when all the national action plans were coming out, they were churning out, I read a lot of them, especially all the Seattle ones I read, cover to cover. Thailand was the only one out of the 11 Seattle countries that even in their first edition of the NAP, they put targets, the, not process targets, but reduction of use or this or that, actual AMR targets that they wanted to achieve. I think that is critical. And even now when I ask many, many countries, you know, are you put, going to put any targets this time in your second edition of NAPS? They're still not sure. And, and the excuse that is given is that, you know, our baseline data is not good enough. But I think, I think higher level targets can be set and they should be set, and that will really help uh, track it as well as push politicians. Uh, and one last point before we really wrap up, we, the, the tracks data, you know, the tripartite uh, AMR country survey or whatever that comes out every year, brought out by the tripartite secretariat uh, in WHO, we looked at a certain question number 7.6 last year, we looked at the same question this year. We were slightly focused on the Fleming Fund countries. The point is that more than a very high percentage, I'm talking about 60 or whatever percentage, it has remained same that countries do not use the data that they generate to make decisions. Can you believe it? Data might be bad, but like John Sterling will always say, Use bad data, don't make treatment guidelines from it, but just get on and make some policy decisions because there you work with approximations anyway. So all to say that since last year till now, the same countries we looked at, the numbers haven't shifted. Data is still not being used either in human health or in animal health for policy making and decision making. So I'll leave it at that, my small 
bit of what I've learned over these past few years. And uh, Eduardo, can I hand it back to you to give us some few major key takeaways, and then I'll just you know, thank everyone and we can wrap this up because we have really gone over time, though it was really rich and nice, I must say. Back to you, Eduardo. Uh, Quick. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot again. Uh, so first of all, you know, thank you for all of the experts and all of the panelists. I think one of the points we have seen is how the interventions against AMR uh, could have mitigated you know, had had countries actually been investing in this intervention, implementing these interventions, they could have mitigated the effect, the very bad and adverse effect of the pandemic. And so as, as the world, as we talk about uh, stopping COVID-19, making sure that there will be no pandemic again, I think those words should be supported by investments in interventions against AM, AMR. We have seen how complex AMR is. We have also seen, we have also heard how complex the interventions would be. But we have also seen how, in a sense, investment in vaccines, new antibiotics, and, uh, on one health, and all of the other great interventions our panelists have talked about would actually help us uh, prevent another outbreak, another pandemic, in a sense, make sure uh, that we don't get to suffer what we're suffering right now. No, COVID-19 is not just a health problem. We have seen how it impacted the economy. We have seen how it has reversed uh, poverty reduction in a lot of countries. This is not something that we want the world to keep on having. So uh, I end there. And we want to thank everyone, all of the audience. I'll be so looking at the numbers. Everybody stayed on until we finished. Not early. So thank you. And we look forward, we and ADB look forward to working with everyone, uh, with IBI, with the Korean government, with ICARS, with our country panelists and see you around. Okay. Thank you, Eduardo, for that quick sum up. So we once again thank the co-organizers with us. There's IVI, uh, Institute Pasteur Korea, uh, Embassy of Denmark in uh, Korea, uh, ADB, of course, and ICARS. So we thank all of you and your respective teams for helping us conduct this event. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that, yeah, the recordings will be available uh, in due course, and we will uh, make an announcement to all the registrants, not just the participants. Obviously, the registrants missed it. And like Eduardo said, uh, many of them stayed on, you know, about 170 plus uh, for the entire period. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you, and we look forward to meeting you again in the new year. And have a good, uh, shall we say, holiday season, and hope all of you can take a bit of a break. Thank you and over. Thank you.